Quick question. If your car broke down right now and you had to pay $1,000 to get it fixed, would you have the money to do so? Well, based on a survey conducted by Bankrate, only 39% of Americans said that they would be able to afford to pay $1,000 for an emergency expense. Now, whether you have $1,000 or not, doesn't really matter. The point that I'm trying to get across is that many Americans are in a bad place financially and they could use some help when it comes to managing their money, which is why in today's video, I'm going to show you how to manage your money and grow your wealth like the 1% do. Not only that, but I'm also going to give you my budgeting spreadsheet that I use to track my income and expenses for free. So make sure you stick around and keep watching. All right, so I'm sure this is not your first time thinking about how to manage your money. And you've probably even tried out a bunch of rules and formulas before. But the one thing that most people forget about personal finance is that it's personal. Instead of relying on these fixed rules and formulas to fix all of your problems, your first step should always be to set small goals. What I mean by that is, let's say your goal is to retire in 40 years with a million dollars. Try to break down that number to see how much you need to save or invest every single day. So going off that same example, if I wanted to retire in 40 years with a million dollars, I would have to invest about $350 a month or about $12 a day. The reason I personally do this is because it not only keeps me more mindful of how I'm spending my money, but psychologically, it takes away the fear and anxiety of trying to reach this million dollar figure. Now, I'm not saying that you need to sign into your account every single day and invest $12. You know, that would be, that'd be kind of crazy if you did that. And most people like myself, we have automatic deposits set up that do that for us, you know? So the main reason you need to break down your financial goals into smaller numbers is so you can mentally track your progress every single day. Speaking of tracking, the next step is to track your monthly income and expenses on a spreadsheet. So now that you have a few goals in mind that you're mentally tracking every single day, the next step is to physically track how much you make, spend, and invest every single month. As I mentioned in the intro, I use a custom spreadsheet that I made to track all of my personal income, expenses, and investments. And if you're interested in using the same spreadsheet that I use, you could just go to www.guilt22.com slash templates and download it for free. I think it'll ask you for your name and email, but that's really about it. Now on this spreadsheet, I can not only track my monthly income, expenses, and investments, but I can also uh, make a budget or set a budget and easily compare that to how I'm actually doing every single month with a few charts and graphs that I have set up. You know, it's it's pretty easy to use, so I'm not going to waste any of your time going over it. But regardless of whether you download it or not, you need to figure out a way to track your income and expenses on a monthly basis. Doing so will not only give you accountability, but you can also see areas of improvement and where you need to cut down on expenses. All right, so after you figure out a method to track your budget, the next step is to take care of any bad debt that you have. And there's a reason why I say bad debt. A lot of people, especially in America, have a very bad relationship with debt. In America alone, the average person is $90,460 in debt. So it's pretty easy to see why most people have a negative view on debt. If you're one of these people that have a negative view on debt, I just want you to understand that debt is just a tool, which is why we can have good debt and bad debt. Now, there are a lot of definitions for good debt and bad debt, but for me personally, good debt is just money that I can borrow at a rate lower than the rate I can make money with. So for example, if I borrow money from the bank at 8% to start my business, but I know I can make 10% every year by using the bank's money, that's good debt. You know, I'm borrowing money to make more than what I just borrowed. Now, on the other hand, if I borrowed money at 8%, but I use this money to buy a luxury car that I'm only going to use as my personal vehicle, that would be an example of bad debt. Not only am I going to lose 8% every single year, but my car is also going to go down in value every single year. And plus, since this is my personal vehicle, it's not like I'm going to rent it out or use it to bring in extra cash flow. All in all, I'm going to end up losing a lot more than just 8%, which is why it's an example of bad debt. 
This latter form of debt is what most Americans have an experience with, and that's because most Americans don't have any businesses or rental properties where they can borrow money to make more money. And to be fair, you watching this video might be able to relate to that. But before you go and take out a loan for a business that you've always wanted to start, you need to make sure that you get rid of all your bad debt first. And this includes anything like credit cards, um, auto loans, and generally any other personal loans that you might have. Basically, everything that's not a student loan or a mortgage should be paid off ASAP. For any student loans and mortgages, I personally would just pay the minimum amount every single month and any extra money you don't invest or spend, just use that to pay these two off faster. But again, everything that's not a student loan or a mortgage needs to be paid off as soon as possible. And really there's two methods to be able to do this. The first is to use something called the avalanche method. And in this method, you're going to pay the minimum amount every single month on all your loans. But with any extra money that you have, you put all that money towards the debt with the highest interest rate. Now, it's called the avalanche method because after you're done paying off your most expensive debt, you can use the money that you saved in monthly payments from that debt, plus the extra amount that you were paying, and put all of that towards paying off your second most expensive debt, and then your third most expensive, and so on until you're debt free. Another effective method to paying off debt is to use something called the snowball method. In this method, you start by paying off the debt with the smallest balance and work your way up until you pay off the debt with the highest balance. This won't save you as much money as the avalanche method will, but the benefit of using the snowball method is that you'll be able to get a win under your belt much quicker, which will then hopefully motivate you to pay off the next biggest debt and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what method you choose. Just pick one that you like and start paying off your debt. Both of these methods are infinitely better than not doing anything. All right, after you're done paying off your bad debt, the next step is to start a nice little emergency fund for yourself. The amount that you pay or that you put in towards this emergency fund will heavily depend on you and your living expenses, but now that you're tracking how much you spend every single month and you have no bad debt you need to worry about, what I would recommend is putting away at least three to six months worth of living expenses into a high yield savings account. Obviously, you can put in more if you like based on your risk tolerance level, but just remember, you're losing money every year with a savings account. Inflation right now is about two to three percent, and if the interest on your savings account isn't matching that, which I'm almost positive it's not, you're losing money. Now, regardless, we still need some money set aside in a savings account in case something comes up and you need to access money quickly. You don't wanna be taking money out of your investment accounts to pay for any expenses that come up because by doing so, you're going to ruin all the compounding interest that you're generating on your investments. All right, so after you've successfully set up a nice little emergency fund for yourself, the next step is to stack skills. Now, I don't want you to confuse this as me telling you to just acquire any old skill, you know, because that's way too broad. And there's so many skills out there that would be completely useless for you to learn in order to grow and become more valuable. There's a great example that Alex Hermosi uses to explain this concept of stacking skills. And he explains it something like this. He says, let's say you're good at math. You know, that's a skill that you have. It's not very monetizable, but it's a skill nonetheless. You say to yourself, well, I guess I can also learn how to do some basic credits and debits and do some bookkeeping. You know, great. Now you've put two skills together and you have something that is monetizable. And then you say, you know what? I'm actually gonna go to school and become an accountant and get my CPA. Now that skill has made you even more valuable to the market. You know, you then learn about tax codes and now you're able to work with businesses and help save them hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year. And then you learn how to decrease liability with insurance because you continue down this path of stacking skills on top of each other. And every new skill that you acquire becomes disproportionately more valuable than the skills before it. You can't just jump from being good at math 
to helping businesses save millions by maneuvering complex tax codes. You know, you need to stack your skills and create a link that connects everything together. So whether you're an entrepreneur or an employee, you need to evaluate yourself and recognize what is the next skill I need to learn and stack on top of all the prior skills that I already have. All right, so after you've stacked a few of these skills together, you can now start branching off and creating new scalable, diversified, and passive streams of income based off of those skills. So going back to the accountant example, now that you have a bunch of very specific skills, what else could you branch off into that would help you bring in some extra revenue? You know, um, maybe you could start a YouTube channel and cover finance and accounting related topics. Uh, you could also create a training course to help bookkeepers get better at their job without going through school and becoming an accountant. Um, you could also just start up your own practice and hire other accounts to work for you. There's thousands of different possibilities here and obviously you would need to learn some new skills in order to pursue some of these. However, the point is you have to build some additional streams of income that don't have a low glass ceiling for growth, that are not directly affected or influenced by your mainstream of income, and that also have the ability to make you money without you directly trading in your time. Just remember, the average millionaire has roughly seven streams of income, and I promise you, they're not just working seven jobs to make that type of money. They do one job very well or run one business very well and have a few other streams of income that make money independent of their time invested. All right, finally, the last step to managing money like the 1% is to let your money grow in tax sheltered accounts. Now, most of you are probably already doing this by investing in your 401k or Roth IRA, which is great. But if you haven't started yet, let me explain why you need to. First and foremost, tax sheltered accounts are completely legal and they're just investment accounts that provide the added benefit of a favorable tax treatment. So this could be something like a 401k or Roth IRA where depending on which one you pick, you might not have to pay tax when you deposit or withdraw your money. Now you also have the option to invest in a bunch of these tax sheltered accounts, which is obviously better than just picking one. But if you had to pick only one, I would definitely, definitely start off with a 401k. I personally only just started doing this after I started making decent cash flow every year. You know, I just, before I just wanted to save all of my money and put it back into my business to help it grow. And now that I'm happy with how it's doing, I take the extra money uh, that I set aside every month for investments and I put it into a few of these tax advantage accounts as well as a normal investment account that I just use to short Tesla stock and gamble on crypto. Anyways, now that you have a solid plan, it's time to actually start taking some action and you can start by scrolling down and liking the video, subscribing to the channel and turning on post notifications. Also, if you're a company driver, owner operator looking for a new opportunity with a high quality, high paying company, feel free to submit an application at www.guilt22.com slash careers. So yeah, with that being said, thanks so much for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video.